between Jephthah, the Gileadites, and the king of Ammon, the people of Ammon. And so we're going to look at Judges chapter 11, verses 12 through 28. If you'll turn there with me. The title of our sermon tonight is Reasoning with the Unreasonable. Reasoning with the Unreasonable. Judges chapter 11, verses 12 through 28. And hear the word of the Lord. Now Jephthah sent messengers to the king of Ammon, the people of Ammon, saying, What do you have against me that you have come to fight against me in my land? And the king of the people of Ammon answered the messengers of Jephthah, Because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt from the Arnon as far as the Jabbok to the Jordan. Now therefore restore those lands peaceably. So Jephthah again sent messengers to the king of the people of Ammon and said to him, Thus says Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab, nor the land of the people of Ammon. For when Israel came up from Egypt, they walked through the wilderness as far as the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, Please let me pass through your land. But the king of Eden, Edom would not heed, and in like manner they sent to the king of Moab, but he would not consent. And so Israel remained in Kadesh. And they went along through the wilderness and bypassed the land of Edom and the land of Moab and came to the east side of the land of Moab and encamped on the other side of the Arnon. But they did not enter the border of Moab, for the Arnon was on the border of Moab. Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, king of Heshbon, and Israel said to him, Please let us pass through your land into our place. The Sihon did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. So Sihon gathered all his people together, encamped at Jahaz, and fought against Israel. And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sihon and all his people into the hands of Israel, and they defeated them. Thus Israel gained possession of all the land of the Amorites who inhabited that country. They took possession of all the territory of the Amorites from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the wilderness to the Jordan. And now the Lord God of Israel has dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel, Should you then possess it? Will you not possess whatever Chemosh, your God, gives you to possess? So whatever the Lord, our God, takes possession of before us, we will possess. And now, are you any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel? Did he ever fight against them? And while Israel dwelt in Heshbon and its villages, in Aurora and its villages, and in all the cities along the banks of the Arnon for 300 years, why did you not recover them within that time? Therefore I have not sinned against you, but you wronged me by fighting against me. May the Lord the judge render judgment this day between the children of Israel and the people of Ammon. However, the king of the people of Ammon did not heed the words which Jephthah sent him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're very grateful to you, Lord, for your word, uh, grateful for the book of Judges and the lessons that you have for us here. We know that these things have been written for our admonition, uh, those upon whom the end of the ages has come. And we look now to Judges chapter 11 and this encounter between Jephthah and the king of the people of Ammon. And Uh, We want to um, learn from your word. Lord, please help us. Spirit of God, please illumine our understanding. Um, Spirit of God, please uh, enable us to apply the word of God. Um, Seal it to our hearts, Lord. Help us to understand and to heed your word. Be with us now as we work through the text. Um, Thank you for my brothers and sisters here. Thank you for this blessing of having an evening service where we can consider your word together. Um, Lord, it is a light to our path, a lamp to our feet, and it was just continuously reminded of how desperately we need your word, your revelation to us, and how desperately we we need you to teach us, Lord. Be with us now, and bless this time together for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. We pray all these things. Amen. Reasoning with the unreasonable, Judges chapter 11, verses 12 through 28. As we return to the book of Judges, and now particularly Judges chapter 11, The people of Israel, uh, the covenant people of God, have once again done evil in the sight of the Lord. They've gone and they've served the Baals. They've served the Ashtoreths. They've turned away from the God of Israel, and they've run after the gods of the Canaanites again. Uh, The Canaanites who surrounded them, the Canaanites who now dwell among them because Israel has failed to drive them out. And Israel has again played the harlot with the gods of Syria now, Sidon, Moab, Ammon, and the Philistines. So in chapter 10, verse 7, as you would expect, as a 
a consequence of God's holiness and his covenant love for the people of God, the anger of the Lord once again burns hot against Israel, and they now find themselves under the oppression of the Ammonites. God sold them into the hand of their enemies uh, for judgment against them. And now they have in their oppression, in the misery that follows, Israel has, of course, called out. They've cried out to the Lord for mercy, as they've done so many times before. They're the covenant people of God. So when times get tough, they know where to go. They cry out to the Lord for mercy, but the Lord, not to be trifled with, the Lord has basically told them to go cry out to their idols that they've raised up for themselves and let them deliver them. There is a time when the patience of God will come to an end. (laughs) That's illustrated in this point with Israel time and time again through the book of Judges. Uh, Israel has sinned against God. They plunge themselves over and over again into idolatry. God demonstrates through the book of Judges his long-suffering, his patience with them. Uh, But there is a time when God's patience will come to an end. Israel must be brought to a true sense of her need so that she will genuinely, genuinely repent and turn back to God, turn back to the Lord. And so the Lord essentially says to Israel, I'm not going to do it this time. I'm not going to deliver you. Go to the idols that you've raised up. Let them save you. So at the end of chapter 10, we have a foreboding and ominous sight at the border of Israel. The Ammonites encamp in Gilead, and they prepare to attack. And so Israel, in response then, encamps at Mizpah, and they go looking for someone to lead them into battle. Now, in a a humiliating act of desperation, in a faithless act of desperation, the elders of Gilead are forced to plead with their estranged brother, Jephthah, the son, of a fa- the son of their father by a harlot. They had kicked Jephthah out of the family. They had cast him out, forced him to flee. And now they go to plead with their estranged brother, Jephthah, to lead them. While away, Jephthah's earned a reputation for himself. He's become a gibor, as the Bible says, a mighty man of valor. And now his brothers are coming, crawling back to him to deliver them from the hands of the Ammonites. They may feel as though they've got nowhere else to go. Jephthah would certainly have been the last resort. But as you remember, the elders of Gilead in this have neglected to seek the Lord's face. They are going about this on their own. The Lord, as it were, seems to be silent behind the scenes now as the narrative proceeds. And this act of desperation is faithless on the part of Gilead. They don't seek the Lord. Jephthah, while their actions are faithless and desperate, Jephthah, motivated by pride, motivated by power, probably at this point motivated also by a sense of vengeance, wanting to get back maybe a little bit at his, at his brothers who had cast him out. All the while, God sits silent on the sidelines, it, it would seem. Nevertheless, demonstrating great compassion for his people, the Lord says in chapter 10, verse 16, that his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. And the Lord will raise up a deliverer. The, the Lord will protect, save, and deliver the apple of his eye. And although he appears to be silent, he's certainly sovereign over all of these circumstances that are coming to pass. He's preparing their deliverance, and he's preparing their deliverance through the very one that they had so spitefully treated years ago. And from the sermon last Lord's Day, we know that they treated Jephthah in the same way they've been treating the Lord. Jephthah becomes a living parable, as it were, of the way that they've treated the Lord. Gilead may have crawled back to Jephthah in an act of desperation, but it was Almighty God who has been raising up him, Jephthah, as judge over his people. So now as we come back to chapter 11 and we look at verse 12 together, Jephthah now acting in his new capacity as head and commander over the Gileadites in Israel. Now considering what we know of Jephthah, what we know of Jephthah's motivations for taking the job in the first place, we might have expected Jephthah's leadership to be like the leadership of Abimelech before him. Abimelech was described in many of the same ways. Jephthah seems to be following in that those footsteps a bit with uh, hanging out with the rough raiding rebels that he was. 
uh, we expect that Je- Jephthah may be a lot like Abimelech. But out of the gate, Jephthah here proves that he's taking leadership in Israel seriously. He's taking his leadership responsibilities very seriously, and he shows real leadership here beginning in chapter 11, verse 12. He shows wisdom. He shows skill in how he deals with the king of Ammon, and before Jephthah brings them to swinging swords in close quarters, Jephthah's going to try his hand at diplomacy from a safe distance. Verse 12, so Jephthah then sent messengers to the king of the people of Ammon saying, What do you have against me that you've come to fight against me in my land? Do you see? Why are you attacking me? You have no cause. This is my land. Verse 13. And the king of the people of Ammon answered the messengers of Jephthah, because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt from the Arnon. The Arnon was a river in the south. As far as the Jabbok, the Jabbok was a river in the north, and to the Jordan, which was a river to the west of Gilead on the western border. The king of Ammon said, Now therefore, the end of verse 13, restore those lands peaceably. They're my land, the king of Ammon said. So Jephthah refers to it as my land. The king of Ammon refers to it as my land. And what we have here in Judges chapter 11 is a good old-fashioned land dispute. Right? It's a land dispute. This is the land on the eastern side of the Jordan River, this little segment of land, sliver of land, lies north of Moab, and it lies west of Ammon, okay? Just west of Ammon, between Ammon and the Jordan River. So that's where this little sliver of land is, on the eastern side of the Jordan River. So, the king of Ammon simply wants to control this little strip of land that lies between Ammon and the Jordan River. He'd like to just annex that little piece of land. That's land currently occupied by Israel. Gilead is located in that land. And what has the king of Ammon done? He's crossed the border into this sliver of land, and he's set up shop in Gilead. Now, the two leaders here are obviously at odds. Jephthah wants to set the record straight, see if they can avoid a war. And so then Jephthah argues for why the king of Ammon has violated their land rights by invading their territory. And Jephthah makes four arguments to the king of Ammon. Four arguments. The first of these arguments that encompasses most of our text is the historical argument. The historical argument. That argument believes uh, begins in verse 14. Look at verse 14 with me. So Jephthah again then sends messengers to the king of the people of Ammon and said to him, thus says Jephthah. Now consider with me, thus says Jephthah is a common address given at that time by an imperial power to a subject. Common language used by an imperial power addressing a subject. It's similar to how, if you remember in 2 Kings chapter 18, similar to how the Rab Shekah, addresses Hezekiah on behalf of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, like Israel, is subject to Assyria, right? This same kind of language now used by Jephthah. Jephthah has some confidence now in his position as head and commander. Thus says Jephthah, he's writing this to the king of Ammon. Jephthah was obviously not going to be soft peddling the talks. (laughs) Jephthah would not be going to appease the Ammonites, He wouldn't be acting as their subject. Thus says Jephthah. Jephthah is acting with confidence. Now, what does Jephthah say? Verse 15, Israel did not take away the land of Moab, nor the land of the people of Ammon. We weren't the aggressors in the dispute like you're being now. We didn't take their land away from them. Jephthah says, we didn't take either the land of Moab or the land of the people of Ammon. Verse 16, for when Israel came up from Egypt, They walked through the wilderness as far as the Red Sea, and they came to Kadesh. Then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, Please let me pass through your land. But the king of Edom would not heed. And in like manner, they sent to the king of Moab, but he would not consent. So Israel remained in Kadesh. Now follow his argument here, beginning in verse 16, right? We asked for permission. Permission was denied. We respected their land rights. We didn't attack them. 
We didn't take the land in retaliation. What did we do? When we were denied permission to go through the land, we remained in Kadesh. Then, avoiding conflict with either of those kings, either with the king of Edom or the king of Moab, we circled around Edom and Moab on our way. And if you look at the geography of the area, it took Israel quite a way out of their way to go around those two territories. But it was as the Lord would have it, right? The Lord would not let them go through Edom, would not let them pass through Moab. They went around. Verse 18, and as they went around, they went along through the wilderness and bypassed the land of Edom and the land of Moab. And they came to the east side of the land of Moab. Now, if you remember our geography, we've got the sliver of land in question between the Jordan River on the west side, Moab and Ammon essentially on the east side. Israel now is to the far east of Moab, away from the land in question. So they passed, they came to the east side of the land of Moab, verse 18, and encamped on the other side of the Arnon. But they did not enter the border of Moab, for the Arnon was the border of Moab. But that's the historical argument, part one. How would we summarize that argument? Jephthah is essentially saying, we actually respected their land rights in a way that we conducted ourselves, something that you're not doing now. <laughs> We respected land rights. That's not what you're doing by crossing our border and attacking us. Here's historical argument part two, verse 19. Then, what does Jephthah say? He reminds the, the king of the people of Ammon. Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, the king of the Amorites, the king of Heshbon. And Israel said to him, please let us pass through your land into our place. But Sihon did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. And so Sihon gathered all his people together, encamped in Jahaz, and fought against Israel. No return answer from Sihon. Sihon was the king of the Amorites. He simply, he didn't decline, didn't send a letter, didn't send messengers. What did Sihon do? Sihon mobilized troops and attacked Israel. Didn't waste any time. Forgot diplomacy altogether, just going to attack. Verse 21. And the Lord God of Israel then delivered Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. Thus Israel gained possession of all the land of the Amorites, that's interesting, isn't it, who inhabited that country. They took possession of all the territory of the Amorites from the Arnon, that river in the south, to the Jabbok, that river in the north, and from the wilderness to the Jordan, the Jordan along the west coast of the land in question. It's the particular land that's involved in this dispute, isn't it? Where'd they get that land? They took it from the Amorites, right? Historical argument part two, the land that we did take didn't belong to you. <laughs> it doesn't belong to you. It belonged to the Amorites, not the land of the Ammonites. All we wanted to do, Jephthah said, all we wanted to do was pass through. And they attacked us. We didn't attack them. They attacked us. And when they attacked us, the Lord God of Israel delivered them into our hands and gave us their land. Verse 23. And now the Lord God of Israel has dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel. Should you then possess it? You see his argument? It's smart, isn't it? Historical. It's accurate. It's a good argument. Jeff is essentially saying, what gives you the right? You've got no right to that land. The land has never been your land, and your people, the people of Ammon, have never dwelt there. Based on Jephthah's historical argument, they have no historical claim to the land they're invading, okay? Now, what the historical argument here also reveals is that Jephthah's no mere brute, we might have thought that Jephthah was a mere brute, but Jephthah is not simply hired muscle. Jephthah, Jephthah knows his history. He's got some leadership skills. Jephthah's got some diplomacy skills, some diplomatic skills. Israel has been righteous, Jephthah says. Your aggression, king of Ammon, has been unrighteous. But it also reveals that Jephthah knows his biblical history. Numbers 21. Numbers 21 explains that it was the Amorites that originally had taken that land from Moab. The Amorites had invaded Moab and had taken it to themselves. 
Israel's wilderness wanderings took them as far as the border of the people of Ammon. The Ammonite border is described in uh, Numbers 21, I believe it is, verse 24, as heavily fortified. And so Israel didn't go in. Deuteronomy 2 explains that the Lord had specifically restricted them from going into Ammon. And so Israel took the land of the Amorites up to the border of Ammon just to the east. And when Moab attacked Israel, they attacked unprovoked and God gave them the land. Now Jephthah's detailed knowledge of their history makes the faithlessness of Israel at this time even more glaring. The fact that Jephthah knows these things in such detail shows, it manifests that Jephthah, other Israelites like them, knew their biblical history, knew what had been taught them through the generations of what God had done for his people and what Israel had done in the land and how God was faithful to deliver the land for the people, right? They would have known these stories. They would have understood their history, just like Jephthah. They knew these things. It makes their faithlessness even more glaring, doesn't it? Israel is charged with forgetting the Lord their God. It doesn't mean they had short-term memory loss. It doesn't mean they've got a memory problem. They don't want to retain him in their knowledge. Their forgetfulness of the Lord is willful. Do you see? It's willful. They forget until what? Until when? Until they need him. And then they remember. <laughs> they remember and they go crying to him. And the Lord has said, no, you go cry back to the idols that you've chosen for yourselves. Jephthah shows us they knew Israel's history. They knew the account of what God had done for his people. Now, having very well established the historical argument, Jephthah then shrewdly, sarcastically posits a theological argument to the king of Ammon. Look at verse 24. Will you not possess... Whatever Chemosh, your God, gives you to possess. <laughs> so whatever the Lord, our God, takes possession of before us, we will possess. God is the one who gave Israel Sihon's land. Jephthah essentially says to the king of Ammon, you're going to have to be content with whatever land Chemosh gives to you. That's the land you're going to get, and you need to be content with whatever your little God gives to you. Reference to Chemosh here appears to be a sarcastic insult. Do you see? Sarcastic insult. Chemosh isn't the God of the Ammonites. Now, this is interesting. It's also a point at which many Bible deniers will use to say, ah, look, see, there's an error in the Bible. There's no error in the Bible. This is a sarcastic insult, and it's fascinating if you just think about it for a moment. Chemosh isn't the god of the Ammonites. The god of the Ammonites was Milcom. Chemosh was the god of the Moabites. Now think with me. This little land, this little sliver of land in question, used to belong to Moab. The little god, the little G god, over that little section, that little sliver of land, is Chemosh. Chemosh lost that land from Moab to the Amorites. You know, if you were charitable to that little G God, you might say that he gave that land to the Amorites. <laughs> and then he loses it again to Israel. <laughs> now think with me for a moment. According to the wicked and ignorant pagan tradition of these people, their little gods, their little idols, controlled these sections of, segments of land. Chemosh or Chemosh was the little god that controlled this land in dispute. It may have been. It may have been that the Ammonites claimed Chemosh as their little god too and so justified their claim on the land as their land. Nevertheless, Chemosh was defeated first by the Amorites who took the land from Moab and then by the Israelites who took the land from the Amorites. Chemosh is 0 for 2 how he would say that, right? He's not doing good. So Jephthah says to the king of Ammon, you claim that little God with those two losses on his record? You can have him, Jephthah says. Will you not possess whatever Chemosh 
your little God gives you to possess, whatever the Lord our God takes possession for before us, that we will possess. You can have what your little God gives to you. Make sense? Right? It's, um, it's a sarcastic jab. Jephthah is a fine diplomat, uh, but Jephthah, Jephthah's also taking jabs at the king of Ammon. He's not appeasing them by any stretch of the imagination. Good for Jephthah, right? Take a stand, Jephthah. So maybe a, a brief meditation on Israel's history in the historical part of this argument has bolstered Jephthah's faith, has bolstered his confidence a little bit in the way that he responds here to the king of Ammon. Jephthah thinks to himself, we serve the true and living God of Israel. We serve the one who's over all of this land. And if the Lord wants us to have this land, he's going to give us this land. It doesn't matter what their little g gods do. Right? It doesn't matter. God is the one who is sovereign over all these things. You take whatever land your little God gives you. We will possess whatever the true and living God gives us to possess. Now, the sarcasm continues with a personal argument. We saw the historical argument. We see the theological argument. Jephthah follows that up with a personal argument. Verse 25. And now he says to them, listen, are you any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did Balak ever strive against Israel? Did he ever fight against them? Do you see that in verse 25? In other words, Jephthah's saying, we got to put it in context and think about the, 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 the interchange that's going on here. Jephthah's essentially saying, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? We don't even get the Ammonite's king, his name in all of this exchange. We don't know who he is. He's not named. And Jephthah asked him, do you think that you're better than Balak? Who do you think you are? Did Balak, that powerful Moabite king, did he ever make a charge against Israel for the land? You know, if anybody could have made a charge like the king of Ammon is making, it would have been Balak. It would have been Balak, but Balak doesn't make that charge. He never crossed our border for an attack on us, as you have, Jephthah argues. In Numbers, chapters 22 to 24, it's a fascinating exchange. If you remember, Balak was certainly against Israel. And he goes after that prophet for prophet, Balaam, to curse Israel, and Balaam refuses to do so. So Balak was against Israel, but not over a land dispute. Balak never brings up a land dispute about this territory. The Moabites, it says, simply feared the presence of Israel, feared their growing strength. So Jephthah essentially says, if Balak and the Moabites have no case, and they didn't invade to take the land from us, then what are you doing here? You presumptuous upstart, <laughs> Jephthah might have added. Well, Jephthah follows that with the last argument to conclude this brief case. He makes the historical argument, he makes the theological argument, a personal argument, and now he concludes with an argument from silence. Verse 26, while Israel dwelt in Heshbon and in its villages and Aurora and its villages and in all the cities along the banks of the Arnon, for 300 years we were there, why did you not recover them within that time? In other words, if there was any just cause for the claim, why is it just now that the claim is being made? If you had a case, why'd you wait all this time, right? If a case was to be made, certainly it would have been made in that period of 300 years. We've been here a long time. This is our land, Jephthah's saying. We live here uncontested for the last 300 years. This is our land. Verse 27. Therefore, Jephthah wraps up his case. Therefore, I have not sinned against you, but you wronged me by fighting against me. May the Lord, the judge. Jephthah has been raised up as a judge. We're going to see the spirit of the Lord come upon him in verse 29. But who does Jephthah acknowledge as the judge over Israel? God, the Lord God. May the Lord, the judge, render judgment this day between the children of Israel and the people of Ammon. It's not going to be Chemosh or Milcom that have any part in this, the Lord Yahweh is the judge. And having come to the end of these terse diplomatic arguments, Jephthah gives it to him straight. He gives, him, gives it to him straight, speaks plainly. His case is solid. His case is airtight. 
His case is entirely reasonable if he were a righteous man. There is simply no good reason why the king of Ammon shouldn't heed the words of Jephthah and turn back if he were a reasonable and a righteous man. If he would think past his own personal interests, if he would think beyond his own personal selfish agenda, there'd be no good reason why the king of Ammon shouldn't heed these arguments from Jephthah, right? However, verse 28, the king of the people of Ammon did not heed the words which Jephthah sent him. Don't pester me with the facts, Jephthah. (laughs) I'm not interested in the facts. There are other motivations at work here, Jephthah. There's another agenda that we're pursuing, another set of parameters that don't subject themselves to reason. Jephthah, that's the only thing you could say about Jephthah's arguments is that they are entirely reasonable and righteous. They're a good case. A good case has been made. They're good arguments. But Jephthah is not reasoning with a reasonable man. Essentially, in the king of Ammon, there are fleshly desires that overrun reason in the natural man. Fleshly desires which overrun reason. Fleshly desires, carnal desires, that overwhelm good judgment. You cannot reason with an unreasonable man. Despite the arguments from reason and truth, Ammon remains unfazed in their wicked and selfish ambitions. And that's what they are, right? Their ambitions, wicked and selfish. And God's going to judge them for their actions. Why are they unfazed? Well, the Ammonites are not interested in reason. (laughs) The Ammonites are not interested ultimately in truth. What are they interested in? They're interested in the land. That's what I want (laughs) We want the land that lies between us and the Jordan River. We've set our minds, set our hearts upon that which we want. And no amount of reason, no amount of right is going to convince us otherwise. That's what we're going to take. And listen, they're camped out in Gilead prepared to make war against Israel. Thousands are going to die. For what reason? It's because that thing that I want. That thing that I want. And they're unable to be reasoned with despite the airtight case that Jephthah makes. It's a biblical case start to finish, and they're not going to listen. They simply want the land. You cannot reason with an unreasonable man. This is what I want. No argument is going to persuade me from my course. You notice that the king of Ammon doesn't have much to say back. (laughs) He doesn't answer back. Yeah, but when when they took the... we're not going to heed your words, Jephthah. <laughs> it's like, that's what they have. It's just, yeah, we're not going to heed. We're not going to listen to that. We want the land. Right? They have no argument. Truth can be so plain, right? The truth can be so clear. The truth so right, righteous. The truth so good. The truth so helpful. The truth abounding in the wisdom of God. The truth bearing with it the mercy and the grace of God. It is the truth of Almighty God. The truth can be so compelling, but ultimately, in that one who is consumed with his own desire, the truth ultimately doesn't matter. Over the years, we've had many conversations. <laughs> in this building and out of this building, that end just like this one. Many, 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 many over the years. God, in his word, says this to you. Here's the truth. Here's the righteous course of action. Here's what God commands. Here's what God would have you do. This is good. God has said that he'll bless those who walk in righteousness. Choose the righteous course of action. Woman, one woman I remember who professed to be a Christian, I had said during the course of our meeting several times, 
This is what the word of God says. Here's what the Bible says. Listen, here's what the Bible says. Into that meeting, she slams her hands down on the desk in front of me and says, I don't care what the Bible says. And she said it about like that. <laughs> we can be overrun by idolatrous, covetous, wicked, unrighteous desires, can't we? Let the one who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. We can be overrun by inordinate desire, by the things that we want. And because we've set our mind, we've set our heart on this thing that we want, we don't listen to reason anymore. And trust me, by the, by the time it gets to that point, you've got people around you who are pleading with you. It's like an all-out war for your soul, saying, why would you persist in this course of action? Don't go down this path. And if they don't do it verbally, they do it figuratively. They slam their hands down on the table and then say, that's not what I want. That's not what I want. I don't care what the Bible says this is what I want. We may think to ourselves that, well, I'm far more reasonable that, that, than that. That can never happen to me. <laughs> no, <laughs> that can happen to any one of us in this room. And it is the Lord who preserves us. It is the Lord who, uh, the Lord who applies truth and reason to our hearts and minds Biblical good judgment, biblical truth is often obscured, overruled, overrun by personal desires, carnal desires, inordinate desires, what the Bible refers to as a covetous desire that Paul says is idolatry. And pray when that time comes that you have people around you who love you, who will tell you plainly what the truth says. But you and I, as we sit here and we consider the wicked course of action that this king of Ammon and the people of Ammon take here in failing now to heed the word of Jephthah, they're not listening to reason. They're not listening to truth. You and I have an opportunity now as we sit here and we hear the word of God preached and we consider the words that the Bible, this example that the Bible has given us of their wickedness, their unrighteousness, and you and I can commit ourselves afresh to say, Lord, help me. <laughs> By your grace, I will not turn from your statutes. I will do your judgments. I will obey your word. I will keep your commandments. And when you find yourself in a circumstance where desire rises up from within your flesh and this little trinket gets dazzled before you by the enemy, you can remember that commitment that you've made and rely upon God for help. God, please, please don't let me be led astray by the desires of my carnal flesh. Don't let me be led astray by worldliness. Don't let me be led astray by foolishness. And then listen to your brothers and sisters. Right? There's safety in a multitude of counselors. You have a family around you that loves you, that cares for you, that will speak the truth to you, that will read the Bible to you, that will confront you. Ultimately, there's no hope here left for the king of Ammon. He refuses to hear the word of Jephthah. And so now Jephthah will put down his pen and he will pick up his sword. And Jephthah becomes the agent of God's judgment against the people of Ammon. The Spirit of God will come upon Jephthah in verse 29, and God will deliver his people. Praise be to God. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I praise you and worship you and thank you, Lord, that you are the deliverer of your people that you are the one, Lord, who preserve us and protect us. Keep us, Lord, from foolishness. Keep us from worldliness. Keep us, Lord, protect us from the inordinate desires, the fleshly or carnal desires of our own fallen heart. Keep us, Lord, from those things that would lead us off the path of righteousness 
and into the path of the the consequences of our own sin and help us, Lord, uh, to see your truth and to love your truth and to cherish and to treasure your truth above all things that we would not be swept away with the wicked. Help us, Lord, to heed your word and not to be like this wicked king of Ammon who turns a deaf ear uh, to the truth being spoken to him through the lips of Jephthah here, your judge. Protect us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Um, we are prone to wander. We easily go astray. Keep us, Lord, in the path. Preserve us for your namesake and preserve us for our own good. Help us, Lord, to prepare ahead of time for when we're tempted uh, to know what we'll do, how we'll do. Help us, Lord, to depend upon you to rely upon you and the strength that your spirit supplies to weather those storms and um, help us, Lord, to listen to righteousness and to heed the words of truth for our good, for your glory. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.